Morning, everyone. Hope you've all had a good week, and uh, it's great to see you all. And uh, I'm sort of left pondering after that children's story, as as Linda said to me, "How do you top that?" <laughs> you know, you couldn't make this stuff up, could you? You know, you just imagine picturing all of that, you know, washing it all off and then eating it. Was it in that order? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, what a great impression. <laughs> Bronwyn, thank you for that uh, children's story. That was uh, enlightening. That was terrific. <laughs> Should have just given the dog a gluten steak. <laughs> Done a swapperoo, <laughs> and it would have gone, mm-mm. <laughs> uh, it's good to be here with you today, and, and uh, it's our privilege to worship God. Uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to transgress a rule of my own. I don't normally share stuff about myself because I don't want to make myself the, the centre of attention, and I've heard too many stories about people that they tell about themselves up the front that I, I, I cringe um, you know, 40 minute birthing stories and stuff like that, you know, and you just go, oh dear, oh dear. So, so because of that, I sort of made it a little bit of an unwritten rule that I don't sort of normally share, share stuff, but I'm going to transgress that rule this morning. And, you know, I went to the um, Faith and Science Conference up in uh, uh, Brisbane and uh, surface rather, and uh, wasn't actually quite sure where I was in surface until a mate of mine told me where I was, and I was actually in the centre of surface there, and I was going, oh, you know, the, the, the Faith and Science Conference, um, most of that was, you know, really quite enjoyable. Some of it was, uh, just went whoosh, completely over my head. Uh, we had a volcanologist from Iceland his presentations just went completely whoosh. But anyway, that's life, isn't it? You know, I'm not a volcanologist and uh, never wanted to be either and never will be and less inclined to do so now. Uh, but we also had Professor uh, Richard Davison from Andrews University and uh, he, he was really good. I thoroughly enjoyed him. But, you know, when you sort of, I, you know, when we had sort of free time and I sort of enjoyed walking, it was early 20s, you know, 24, 25 during the day. And on my last day, I thought, ah, I'll just get my last walk in along the beach. And, you know, so I took, went, went down to the beach, took my shoes off, walked along the sand, just let, you know, I thought, well, by the time I come back here, my toupee would be blowing off and, you know, and, and so I just wanted to just lap up. It was just terrific weather. And as I was walking off the beach, I saw this um, couple there who were just sitting outside the uh, cafeteria. And uh, anyway, she said, oh, you need a rest. Anyway, she saw us a little bit puffed out after a, a, uh, a big workout along the beach. And uh, anyway, so we sort of sat down and we got to sort of chin wag and and um, we exchanged, you know, what she did and what I did and what he did and that sort of thing. And, and I said, oh, look, I'm a pastor and that sort of thing. And, and uh, she said, look, I used to go to church in the 1980s um, back in Auckland and went to such and such church. I won't say who or what it is because I don't want to be sued. And um, anyway, she, she said, oh, look, we'd, we'd lost our faith. And I thought, oh... That's, you know, that's terrible, isn't it? You know, and, and the reason that they lost their faith was because the, the, the pastor, whom still is operating in Auckland, makes it very difficult to walk out the front door unless you're flashing your MasterCard as you're walking out and paying out considerable amounts of money. They uh, operate on the prosperity gospel. The more you give, the more God will give back and, and that sort of thing. Cleflo dollar and, and that sort of in the, in the, in the States, that, that sort of ilk. And uh, anyway, uh, they've done various exposés on Four Corners and that sort of thing and the kind of lifestyle that he leads. 
they lost their faith over that and we sort of just talked a little bit more and I thought, oh, I better get going. And, uh, but anyway, I, I sort of just shared a little bit with them about not losing their faith because he, he himself was fairly well aged and didn't have many more, I didn't think, revolutions of the earth around the sun left. <laughs> and uh, so what it made, was, you know, important was about, yeah, one's faith. And it's, it's a shame that one, you know, would lose their faith. And hopefully that they will be able to rediscover that. Anyway, go back to the hotel, check out, and uh, just get to the, to the airport and Darius. Um, I meet up with Darius, one, one of the colleagues whom we went to college with. He's the field secretary for the SPD. And uh, anyway, we uh, sort of sat down and we sort of caught up on a few things and then it was sort of time to go. Coolangatta Airport is a long airport. It's a long, narrow one. And I'm at the stage in life where I sort of think about where is the gate? What number is the gate? How far is the gate? Anyway, Darius, who's a little bit fitter than me, and sort of walks off, you know, and he sort of was learning to walk at my pace. Anyway, by the time we sort of got to waving my boarding pass, I was clagged. And I had an exit row seat, and I didn't want to lose the exit row seat, which I have done. And uh, anyway, it was also a long way to the ramp. And I thought, oh, anyway, we clocked through, and, and Darius was starting to walk slower and slower. And I thought, oh, sort of got halfway between where I sort of clocked in and to the ramp and I thought, do I ask for help or not? And I thought, well, if I ask for a wheelchair, I'll lose my exit row seat. And then I may not get on or I may. So I thought, I'll roll the dice. So, whoosh. anyway, got to the um, edge of the terminal before the ramp, and anyway, I turned my back to the lady, to the flight attendant who was there, and just sucking on my ventolin, hoping things that would improve. And you know, I thought, oh, we've got to go, because we were, we were one of the first on now, it was, we were about on the very much the tail end. So as we were, were walking out, my pace was getting slower and slower. And the lady who was at the edge of the ramp had sunglasses on, but those sunglasses were looking at me. I went, oh, I thought this is not going to be too good. Anyway, trying to sort of look as natural as possible and <laughs> enjoying the sunshine and, and you know, just sort of... <clears throat> Anyway, by the time I got to the ramp, I just got the finger. You're off. Stay there and have a rest. And I went, uh oh. Anyway, Darius stood there beside me and, and I uh, said, I said, be all right, no problem here. I saw in the corner of my eye, a great big green fire truck moving up. I was going, what on earth is he doing? And, I thought, you know, and then she said, oh, we just called an ambulance. And I was thinking, but I said, can we negotiate about this, please? <laughs> and I'm saying, we're OK. She'll be right, mate. I was trying all the slogans and I said, look, I've travelled like this before, I've done international trips like this before, it'll be okay. Anyway, the manager sort of comes down, totally ignores me and says, no, we're shutting down now, that's it. I said, I'll be okay. No, no, we can talk about this. Anyway, 
It was no. So anyway, the door closed. So we were back inside. Then once the plane took off, I was wheeled back out. And my feet were dangling out the back of an ambulance and I was just watching the plane take off there. And uh, you know, I, I was so looking forward to getting home, seeing Debs and the dogs. I was absolutely gutted, absolutely gutted that I couldn't get on the plane. And because I knew that this stay was not going to be overnight. And so I hesitated texting Tony for a good few hours while I needed to process this. And hence, yeah, <laughs> about three hours later, eventually you got a text about this and uh, you might need to look for a new preacher and blah, blah, blah. You know, and I... <clears throat> While lying horizontal for the next week, I was began to sort of started to think about things. You know, when you sort of got to making that long walk and you know, I out to the plane to get to the ramp and to say no, that's it. I found that gut-wrenching. And to say, no, that you cannot get onto this plane. And as I sort of thought about that, you imagine what that would be like getting to the Purley Gates. And to say, no, you can't get in. Now, there's going to be some Adventists who will wake up after the 1,000 years who will be surprised that they are on the wrong side of the gates. Do you know how I know that? Because in the parable of the sheep and the goats, they were, the, the, both groups were surprised. One was surprised. I didn't know that you were poor, blind, you know, and naked, and I didn't know about that. But then so was the other group as well. And, and so you sort of think, wow, you know, wouldn't that be terrible to wake up 1,000 years too late? And I was thinking, whoa. So as I sort of, you know, and, and, and I would also imagine that, you know, when it's 1,000 years too late, what would some of those reasons be? Well, I don't really like church because the preacher was just dreadful. You know, I come to church and it was as dull as a dog's dinner. Not Bromman's dog's dinner. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> but it was as dull as a dog's dinner, you know. And, and, or, the, or the deacon or the deaconess didn't talk to me. Or nobody rang to check up on me. Or just after a while, I just, things of this world just took over. And what would God say to that? I wonder. Glad you asked that question. Because in great controversy, it clearly states that there will be no excuse that they could blame so-and-so and so-and-so and so, or someone else, the church, and that the reason that they're not there is because of the choices that they have made. So, you know, we, when we are faced with the big things in life, We've got to make sure that we focus on the most important things in life. We get so involved with all what's happening around here, over there, over there, that do you think that Satan wants to pile things on top of one another that we get so busy that we forget who we are? as Seventh-day Adventist Christians? 
course he does. He piles things on, on top of us to detract what is most important. The most important thing that we need in our Christian journey is something called conversion. Conversion. And there was a, a prominent church administrator by the name of Carlisle Boynton Haynes. And we've got a picture of him here. 1882 to 1958. And he was the first uh, war commissioner for the General Conference during World War I. He was an author, administrator, evangelist and a pastor. You name it, he was everything. Now, he gave a fascinating <coughs> sermon on uh, July 11... 1926 at the General Conference. Now, I'm going to transgress rule number two. And rule number two is that I don't like reading copious amounts of stuff. And so, but given the fact that he stated this, preached this before the General Conference, that means his colleagues all the top knobs that you can imagine, people like A.G. Daniels or all the big names, M.L. Andreasen would have been there as well. And, you know, so he preached this before that, but what he said was absolutely enlightening. So, anyway, let me just share a few little excerpts. And he says, as most of you know, my work has been in public presentation of the teachings of the threefold message in various cities of the East and the South. I accepted the message with a, a very earnest, fervent sincerity. I believed in it, as I do now, with all my heart, and I gave it all the energies of my life. I studied for a number of years what seemed to me uh, to be the best method of presentation and of convincing speech. In my ministry, by the help of God, I was able to convince people of the truth of the great message that I believed. Not only convince them, but they were persuaded, many of them, to unite with our churches and join us in this movement. In those years of activity or preaching the message here and there, I felt that the most important thing I could do, I could learn, would be the convincing presentation of the message of God I studied. Therefore, not only to familiarise myself with all the teachings of the prophecies, the great doctrines, but to how to meet the objections how to answer the questions and how to remove uh, the minds of others of anything that would be against their accepting of this message of truth. During those years of preaching, at least during the earlier years of my ministry, my standing with God never concerned me very much. Hmm. Fascinating. Remember, this was at the General Conference. Therefore, <clears throat> there were many times when I would think of it, but not in any seriousness or for any length of time. I believed when I thought of it at all that everything must be all right between me and God because I was engaged in his service. I was doing his work. I was preaching his message and bringing people to believe it and accept it and come with it. They were years of great activity and the activity itself, get this, crowded out in my mind any conscious sense of my own personal need. I went on preaching with great 
or less success. I found that I had a degree of convincing speech and earnestness of presentation that persuaded people to believe uh, what they were told. Just going down a little bit. Some eight or ten years ago, I became concerned about my own experience in Christ. I found that the preaching of the prophecies the, of Daniel, the explaining of the 2,300 uh, days, the 1260 years, the truth of the Sabbath, the signs of Jesus' coming, and the preaching of the unconscious state of the dead had nothing in it, at least why I was doing it, that enabled me to conquer my own rebellious will or that brought into my life the power to overcome temptation of sin. Do you understand what it's saying here? So I've been preaching all these truths here. State of the dead, 1260 days, 2300 days, second coming. But it had no power in of itself to help me uh, overcome temptation and sin. I became somewhat concerned and there were pressed into my conscience the question as to whether I was really accepted of God. I reviewed my seeming success. I looked back over the experience that God had given me. I was inclined to conclude again that because of what I had done and what I was doing, I was safe. I tried to dismiss, dismiss the question that pressed themselves upon me in connection with my defeat when sin overcame me. But I could not dismiss them. They were pressed on me harder and harder. I then felt that the thing to do was to throw myself with new energy and more ardent endeavour into the preaching of the message. I became more rigid in my adherence of my faith. I straightened up some things in connection with my observance of the Sabbath. There were some things that I had allowed myself to do on the Sabbath that I quit doing. I was a little more scrupulous in my obedience with God. I, I preached with greater energy. I threw myself into the activities of ministry hoping that by doing so, I would find peace that I once had and dismiss the drive out of my heart, the fears that were taking possession of me with regard to my own standing before the Lord. But the harder I worked, the more this troubled me. Defeated again and again, my activities didn't help me in any way. But they brought me into greater difficulty. For I found that I had no power in my life to uh, oppose all the temptation and that of the devil. And that again and again I was defeated. The question of personal victory, the lack of it in my life and the need of it began to burn in my soul. But I was finally brought to the spiritual distress, to a place where it was good for me to be, but where I hope I shall never be again, face to face with the profound conviction that preacher as I was and had been for 15 years, I was lost, completely lost. I shall never forget my distress of my mind and heart. I didn't know what to do. I was doing everything I knew how to do. I had made a supreme effort to live as I thought God wanted me to live. I was not doing anything consciously or intentionally wrong. But in spite of it all, the conviction came that I was lost in God's sight. And very nearly I felt that there was no way of salvation. 
but through the mercy of God and the blessing of the Spirit, who never brings us to such a place, but what he desires to carry beyond the place, I was suddenly awakened to the fact that in all my connection with God and his work, I had neglected the first simple childlike step of coming to Jesus Christ for myself by faith in him, receiving pardon for my own sins. All those years I had hoped that my sins were forgiven, but I never could feel sure of it. God brought me back after 15 years of preaching this message to the foot of the cross, and there came to me the realisation of the awful fact that I've been preaching for 15 years, and yet I was an unconverted man. I came to Christ just as I had never known him before, as though I were just beginning to learn the way to Christ as I was in reality. I surrendered my sins to matter now, um, that matter now. I found that something else was necessary. I had the same old problems, the same passions, appetites, lusts, desires, inclinations and dispositions, the same old will, but I found it necessary to abandon myself, my life, my body, my will, my plans, my ambitions to the Lord Jesus Christ and to receive him altogether, not merely as the forgiver of my sins, not merely to receive his pardon, to receive him as my Lord, my righteousness, and my very life. I learned the lesson that the Christian life is not about modification of the old life. It is not any qualification of it, any development of it, not any progression of it, not any culture or refinement or education. It is not built on the old life at all. It doesn't grow from it. It is entirely another life, a new life altogether. It is an actual life of Jesus Christ himself in my flesh. And God had been teaching me that lesson. I don't think I've learned it altogether yet. But there is nothing on earth I want to learn so much as that. Years ago, I used to browse around the old bookstores, seize upon dusty old historical books as supreme treasures, trying to find something that will throw light on, dark, on some dark prophecy. Today, while I am no less interested in the prophecies, I am much more interested with my union with Jesus Christ and in the development and the growth of the progress of my life in me. Becoming a Christian then is not the acceptance of a body of teaching, nor a mental assent to a set of doctrines, nor believing truth of the Bible as a mere intellectual way. It is not joining the church, partaking of the ordinances. It is about entering into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The innermost central glory of the gospel, therefore, is not a great truth or a great message or a great movement, but a great person. It is Jesus Christ himself. Without him, there could be no gospel he came not so much to proclaim a message, but rather there might be a message to proclaim. He himself was and is the message, not his teaching, but himself contributes to Christianity, constitutes Christianity. What I find startling about his testimony was that for 15 years he'd been preaching this message. But he discovered that he was an unconverted person. He discovered that this wasn't just about the set of doctrines. This wasn't just about the prophecies. It includes that. But this was about his union with Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, what I want to say to you today, if you can just remember something today, 
Our greatest need as we sit here is to discover what Carlisle Boynton Haynes discovered that he needed to be converted by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. And we, Nicodemus himself, you know, I know we've looked at Nicodemus a couple of times and several times, but when he came to Jesus by night, as a Pharisee, as a leader of the Adventist movement, in the first century. He was an Adventist, a Seventh-day Adventist, a Sabbath-keeping believer in the coming of the Messiah. And as a church board member, he was most upright. He was most upright. He was most faithful and sincere. You know what Jesus said to him? No mucking about here. No, g'day, how you going? How's your auntie, uncle? How's your dog? None of that. You need to be born again. You need to be born again. Carl, Carlisle Boynton Haynes, you need to be born again. He discovered that. Mark needs to be born again. We all need to be born again. Nicodemus needs to be born again. And that is the essence for us as we walk with him. He discovered that the most important thing for him was his union with Jesus Christ. His union with Jesus Christ. Not just grabbing a little bit of a Bible text as we race out the door, but he himself. Somehow, we need to reorder our life in such a way that our union with Jesus as a person, as a message, will happen each and every day. Let's just turn to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 and I see my time is almost gone. While you're looking that up, I just want to let you know that we're going to start a series on Tuesday week at 5.30 at the church. And it's called The Journey from the Head to the Heart. As Adventists, we are great with this. We're great with the cerebral. But I just want to talk through, you know, over 10 Bible study times, um, Tuesday week, starting at 5.30. We'll go to just a bit before 7.00. And then you've got the rest of the evening to live life. So just want to look at that. We'll look at different aspects of what are necessary ingredients in terms of conversion or, and what helps the head to the heart. All right, let's just have a... So that's Tuesday week, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And all right. Yeah, somewhere down here's verse twenty one. Why do they write it so small? <laughs> Fair income. I see verse twenty here, so we'll start at that one. All right, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled for, for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin 
so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. For, for our sake, he made him, talking about Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, that, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a huge exchange here between Jesus' righteousness, swapping it for our righteousness, so that we will become what? The righteousness of God. Now, when we look at the word righteousness, or just before we get to that, do you know how you well you're doing in your Christian walk? Just before you blurt out and answer that question, how do we normally assess that? How many big sins have I done this week? I haven't done too many. So things must be going really well. Is that right? Nicodemus, when he bowls up and sees Jesus. So, Nicodemus, how many big sins have you done this week? Well, I've... Actually, I haven't done any. I've had a good week. We normally assess our Christian journey on how well we are doing behaviourally. That's, you know, as Adventists, we have encapsulated our relationship with God and too, all too often judge our relationship with God by behaviour, how well we are doing, how well we are keeping uh, the, the various laws. And, and so long as we think that we're staying away from the big things, we're okay. Boom, boom. When it comes to the righteousness of God, we need to look at, we immediately think of laws, behaviour. We need to think of the righteousness and the exchange in which this happens in terms of relationship. The exchange happens when we commit our lives to God. When Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said to him, you must be born again. What does born again look like? It means to that regeneration through his Holy Spirit. And Jesus in about verse 10 of, of chapter 3, he likens the as Jesus is lifted up, um, so, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. And he, he makes that allusion back to the Old Testament of when the snake in the wilderness. You remember when they had in the, the snake in the wilderness, God had sent a plague, a plague of snakes, and many were dying. Moses had to, what? Set up a, set up a serpent on a... On a cross. And so what do the people have to do? They had to keep the Sabbath a lot better. They had to fix up their diet. They had to eliminate certain things out of it. No, what did they have to do again? They had to look. They had to look. This exchange here, first and foremost has to happen when we look to Jesus Christ who is the author and the finisher of our faith. In order for us to be born again, in order for that union to happen, we need to ensure that our relationship with God is in place. That relationship with God happens when we engage with the Bible. God speaks to us through the Bible, so we learn to engage with the Bible devotionally. We learn to engage with God through prayer. 
We learn to do that each and every day. We learn to read the Bible, and for many, they find the Bible... Many struggle reading the Bible. But I say to you, persevere. This is about sometimes the white-knuckle approach. Do you know what I mean by the white-knuckle approach? We hold on until our knuckles turn white. And for many, I'll speak as a bloke, for many blokes they find the Bible really boring to read. Other things are much more interesting. But as we learn to read and see Jesus Christ in it, it becomes more and more interesting. And we learn to enjoy it. God then speaks to us. We ask God, speak to me through your word today. What are you saying, Lord? What are you saying? How do you want, what do you want me to learn from this? And how do you want me to respond to this? Conversion is our greatest need. A mere intellectual, academic knowledge isn't enough. And when it comes to, and I'll finish on this point, when it came to the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, it was the foolish ones who were found to be devoid of that union with Christ, devoid of the spirit, devoid of their spirit and their Christianity. And so they ended up leaving. And unfortunately, I have to give you some bad news. That parable will be fulfilled, literally. There will be many Adventists who will end up leaving the church because of that. And as we sit here, someone like me will be thinking, well, it's not going to be me. I hope not. I hope it's not going to be any of us here. But this parable, there need, it need not be any of us here. But we do have that choice to engage and to prioritise our lives in such a way where God and his mission and his church and our union with him become very much the centre of our lives. We have that choice to do that. As we do that, he changes, transforms our lives, and that conversion happens. Conversion is the only way that we can enter into the kingdom. And then the door of that plane will be open. Isn't that good news? Jesus died for our sins. The thief on the cross was gained, given eternal life. You know, you think about that thief on the cross and he's looking at the saviour who's on the... Hold on. Is he really going to pay for my sins here? He's dying himself here. How can he save me? Do you know what I'm saying? But he obviously got past that and he saw the saviour of the world there who was able to give him eternal life. And the thief on the cross, not through any merits of himself, looked to Jesus and the promise was given to him of eternal life. As we understand the gospel, as we understand the depths of God's and love for humanity, we will appreciate that gift all the more. And my challenge for each one of you this week, as you look into the word, delve into the gospel, Try to understand and appreciate the depth of love that God has for each of us. And we will appreciate all the more the grace that he has shown every one of us.